Hello and welcome to Mount Pleasant Neighborhood Houses Storytelling. For four weeks now, four of the seniors have participated in these workshops where we picked out what would the person particularly be interested in talking about and having people here. We continued to focus it more on the structure, beginning, middle, and end then rehearsing, and then finally recording. And that's what we're here for today, is to listen to the stories, to see the stories by the foretellers, plus the coordinator for the program, and myself, Mary Lee, as the mentor. This whole program is part of what is called Digitally Minded. And it's a project that Mount Pleasant Neighborhood has that has been funded by Social and Economic Development Canada under their New Horizons for Seniors program. So here we go, six tellers in all, and let's sit around the fireplace, sit around a campfire, sit around a kitchen table, and listen to what our tellers have to say. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. But now I'd like to introduce you to Athena Roddick, who is going to tell us her story. Athena. <laughs> so I'm telling the story, the first, my first time. Mm -hmm. What I thought I know now, no, actually, what I thought I know then is how little I know now. Mm -hmm. And that is my first time. The story uh, is stuck in 2017, the summer, in the southern part of Africa. I spent about six weeks with my daughter, mm -hmm. and so many first time. The first time, I saw a lot and a lot of beautiful deer running around so happily until I heard the local call a springbok. And it's a natural McDonald's food in the wild. Oh, <laughs> that kind of is sad. And then the first time I s spent night sleeping in the same bedroom with the bed. Mm. And also the first time I hitchhiking in the remote highway between uh, Namibia and Botswana. And the most I remember the first time is when I was in Zambia. My daughter one morning suddenly asked me, Mom, do you want to walk with the cheetahs? Hmm, why do I want to walk with the cheetahs? <laughs> But if you don't want to, you can walk with lions. But why do I want to walk with lions? And I don't like people making money from animals. And my daughter said, Mom, her brother saw a leopard eating the kill in the tree and underneath was a hyena there eating on the scrap. But all these few weeks, she did not see any lepers at all. So she said, Mom, I want to do something he didn't do. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I see. But, uh, and also he, she said, the reason she chose prefer cheetahs over lions is when the lions reach the age of 18 months, they consider unpredictable and dangerous after the hand by human. So usually the lions sold to farms for people to hunt and get killed. Mm. But cheetahs, you can walk with cheetahs in any age they not consider dangerous. Oh, I see. And then why, why can't you just go on your own? I don't have to go, you want to go, but I don't. She said, uh, well, unfortunately, they have required minimum two people. 
but that day they go with they walk with the lions but not cheaters. Well, that I guess leave me no choice. And I hope my daughter have a holiday without regrets. Seem that is so important to her. So okay. So we did. We actually uh, go to the national park. There's um cheetahs and lion con conservation is it called a conservation site? So we we approaching it. We did see a lot of lions and cheetahs around, which they are huge. I was pretty <laughs> scared, <laughs> but I didn't say anything. I know my daughter feel the same because we both look at each other. We didn't say anything, but just keep on walking until we reach the center. The staff came out, greet us, and explained to us the um, they they have a, the money they charge is contribute to the conservation uh, fund for the cheetahs. And apparently is the, um, the number of cheetahs in Africa is really um, dying. Mm -hmm. They only have about 7,000 and is considered is the, um, the Africa endangered big cat. And so, yeah, this is a good idea, yes. And also, um, so they explain a little bit about the organization. And they lead us, I follow the staff to the field. There were two lab, uh, no, uh, cheetahs. One is eight years old, one is two years old. I did not remember mine is two or eight years old, but I remember if it correctly, it's called Sheila, a female. Mm -hmm. Uh, cheetahs. They have distinctive uh, black solid spot and have a line from the uh, corner of their eyes to the mouth. The legend, uh, the African legend said it's because uh, the cheetahs, the mummy cheetahs crying and crying for days when she returned and in and missing her club. And the cheetah's name, uh, not the cheetah, that name is named uh, from Hindi, means spotted one. And apparently the, the line is really help them to um, reflect the glares from the sun because cheetah hunt in the daytime. And the eye set for 240 degrees we only set for 160 human. And they hunt during daytime. At night, their eyesight just like us, just like human beings. And they are the fastest landed uh, animal. They can run up to 130 kilometers per hour and can acceler uh, accelerate from zero to 100 in three seconds. Yeah. So um, the staff said to us, don't let the cheetahs go because we cannot get it back. <laughs> but then, of course, I, I, I'm so afraid. <laughs> I don't know whether I will hold the cheetahs really <laughs> tight though. So um, the staff teach us how to uh, hold the cheetahs, how to walk with them. And then he put the leash on and follow behind us. When I holding the leash in the beginning, it was really scary, you know. Um, but after a while, I noticed that it's really like walk with your dog. And so I just feel a little bit more comfortable. And, and also, I know the staff is behind me. If anything, uh, he will protect me anyway. So I walk and walk and walk um, into the bush. It's getting, it's not bad, actually. So um, I think it's maybe about 10 minutes. I, I wish it could be longer because I'm feeling pretty comfortable. But then it's about time to go back then. So, you know, we didn't pay a lot. So I have to go back. And and we have a bonus. He said I could uh, pet and stroke the cheetahs. Oh, really? Uh, do I really want to pet and stroke? <laughs> you know. And the staff said, it's OK. OK. So I squashed down and pet and stroke. And uh, it seems OK. 
And then I heard the cheetahs purring. Oh, it sounds just like my cat at home. They purr mean they're happy, then I'm safe too. And I feel happy too. And the staff said to me, oh, if you want, we can take a picture of you. So I, so I still, you know, uh, okay. So I took the only one picture. And then I feel pretty happy and left. And I learned that um, we could, we can only overcome our fears is to face it. And I also uh, will not leave any regrets. Although I spent about maybe less than half an hour with the teachers, but it certainly left a footprint in my heart mm. forever, like my cat. I really wish my cat have also have those solid black spots. And that is my the footprint from my cat. Mm -hmm. And it's really in my heart all the time. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoy my story and I hope you I could hear your story <laughs> soon. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. We're here now for our second person. This is Edie Spears. Thank you. I was ready and I was going to do it. I was going to be the first person in my family to do this. And I'm going to drive the top of the world highway by myself. I hope I don't get eaten by a grizzly bear while I'm there and I hope my car doesn't break down. I had left my daughter and my grandchildren in Whitehorse they were going back to Vancouver via the Cassiar Tunnel. I got to the top of the highway, it was my starting point, and I kind of looked down the highway, and it's 127 kilometers to Alaska. It had been built from Dawson City to Alaska, mainly to be used to transport goods. And I looked down the highway and I thought 127 kilometers, I'm not going to go the whole way. But I looked and it was going up and down and it was twisting and turning. And, and I thought if they built that a little straighter, it would maybe only be 50 kilometers. So my destination was to get to Castle Rock, which is 56 kilometers down the highway. And Castle Rock is a huge outcropping of rock by the side of the road that you can stop there and look out over, look at the view. And it's been, took years and years, generations, for this rock to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for, to, uh, to wear down from what was there. So I started out, and it's, as I looked back, I, I thought that they really could have done a better job of doing it. <laughs> From mid-September to May, the highway is closed because of snow. And the only way you can use that highway is that uh, several people will use skidoos and use it mainly for, uh, for uh, fascination and driving along. And, I drive, I drove slowly, stopping often to take pictures, um, and when I got to Castle Rock, I stopped and got out and I looked out and it was like a magnificent view, it was just beautiful. I read there were information panels all around at every stop, and I was reading them and I stopped and I read that um, the rock was um, uh, 56 kilometers down the road. When you looked out, I could see a field on this side that was just a beautiful sky blue color. And I went back to the information board and read that it was a field of chicory flowers and that chicory is often used for medicinal purposes. Then I looked the other way and there's a beautiful purple area 
and I read the, the poster and it was a tree called the red bug and it's a tree that's got purple flowers. I'm not sure why it's called the red bug when number one it's a tree and it's flowers that are purple but I thought well you know it's their country. <laughs> well it's my country too basically. Um, and then I kind of looked around and I noticed that there were lots of blueberries and lots of cranberries to munch on and I thought that's a really nice place just to stop and have a snack. But as I'm sitting there on a part of the rock and I'm looking out and I noticed that the bushes were starting to move and I thought now it could be a bear it might be a grizzly bear or a black bear or maybe it's the breeze now I was not going to sit around and wait to see what this was when I was in Laird, I had listened to a lecture by one of the rangers that told us how to identify grizzly bears and black bears. Now, I thought, if that's a bear, I'm not going to do a physical on this bear <laughs> to find out exactly what kind of bear this is. So I grabbed some blueberries and I went back to my car and I had coffee in the car, of course. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching but I don't see any bear coming out because I thought, you know, if the bear comes there all the time, he's going to be a little resentful that I'm eating his berries. So I made sure my car doors were closed and my light, my windows were up and I'm waiting. And then I noticed it's starting to snow. And I thought, okay, I'm up here 56 miles from the starting point. I had no cell phone and my daughters and my family didn't know exactly where I was up here. They just knew I was up there someplace. Now I have to tell you, I have two daughters and grands, a few grandchildren who have traveled a great deal. And whenever they travel, the rules are you must write to me and let me know what's going on. You must phone me collect at least once a week and they said collect that's expensive I, said, I don't care you have to phone and let me know where you are where you're going and how long you're going to be there so I have received phone calls from many countries in Europe and Australia and China and Japan I have wonderful telephone bills then <laughs> but I decided that you know they didn't know where I was and I really needed to turn around and go home back to my starting point and I thought I turned around and then I thought the snow's getting a little heavier it's not covering the ground or anything but I know what it's like driving on wet roads so I'm sitting there okay fine if I hit a turn and slide off the road that's okay I'm a Canadian I can get out and I can walk in that snow I did that when I grew up and I could do it now. <clears throat> it's like, I mean, how far? 56 kilometers is only, what, about 30 miles, so that's okay, and you know, I can do that. But I thought, you know, I was standing there just looking out, because um, there's all these little parts you can park on, eh? And I'm looking out and I thought, okay, it's, it's okay. It's off the road, but I've got a beautiful view and I'm looking at, at this view, view and I'm thinking it's beautiful, it's colorful, there's snow falling, but it's serene and it's like it's just so calming. And I felt, despite the fact I'm standing beside my car and not in the car in case the bear comes around, I'm thinking I feel very safe, the air is fresh and it's beautiful up here. So I got back in my car, it wasn't stuck or anything, and it wasn't snowing that much that I'd get stuck anyway. And I headed back towards my starting point. And I got to the top of the hill and I looked down on Dawson City and I looked on the George Black Ferry. And the George Black Ferry was parked there. He was pointed south and he was waiting for me. I was going to get on that ferry, I was going to go south, 
and I was going to go home to Vancouver. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. So this is Daniela Gundorge, who's going to tell us a story. Thank you. My father said he would never get a cat. That all changed Thanksgiving of 2000. My parents, my brother and I, piled into our Subaru uh, to go to my grandma's house in Toronto for Thanksgiving, as we did every year. And it was a beautiful day, so we're driving along the Highway 7, and we decide to take a walk on this beautiful fall day, this Thanksgiving weekend. We're walking through and the sun is pouring through. We're having a great day. We're excited to go to grandma's. And we come back to the car and we realize my dad has left the lights on in the car and the car battery died and our car was kaput. So we have to walk to the, most, to the closest town, the neighboring town of Marmara in between Ottawa and Toronto. And when we get there to the car garage, they told us, well, it's Thanksgiving weekend, so we can take your car, but it won't be ready until after Thanksgiving weekend. So we called up grandma and said, I don't think we're gonna make it on time. We're stuck in Marmara. We found a motel. We were the only people at this motel. And without a car, on Thanksgiving weekend, we had to walk the streets of this small town called Murmura to try to find a Thanksgiving dinner. And we walked and we saw closed signs on every restaurant that we passed by. And we thought, how are we even going to find <laughs> food for a Thanksgiving dinner? And eventually, we find a gas station and we get a box of Fruit Loops and some milk. And I remember having Fruit Loops for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we hung out at the, at the motel that night, just the four of us watching, I think, Family Feud on television or some other, some other TV show that wasn't, you know, that was exciting to us at the time as eight-year-olds. And then finally, the Tuesday of the weekend, uh, the weekend's passed, the Tuesday comes, everything is open again. And we're so excited that we finally have our car back. We can finally uh, get on the road and get out of Marmara that we decide to go to a restaurant in Marmara to celebrate. And we go into this restaurant in Marmara and there's a sign that says free kittens. And my brother and I were twins, so we always have each other's back and we just look at each other and we start jumping up and down and screaming and saying, Mom and Dad, please, we need a kitten. We need a kitten. We can't go anywhere without a kitten. And my dad says, absolutely not. I don't like cats. We're not going to have an animal. I'm going to have to feed it. I'm going to have to take care of it. We're not getting one. And the entire brunch, the entire breakfast, we bugged him. And we talked about it over and over again. We wouldn't drop it. And as we're leaving, he says, Okay, you can have a kitten. And we erupt, and we get to choose this beautiful calico female little kitten that was about, you know, this big, this tiny little burrito of a kitten. And we have a box for it, and a blanket, and some cat food in the back of our car going all the way home. And my parents are in the front of the car thinking, what a nightmare of a weekend. <laughs> we had our car break down. We didn't get to have Thanksgiving with the family. We now have a cat we have to deal with. And I said from the back of the seat, Dad, this was the best Thanksgiving ever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so we have Susan Coleman now today. You know, I never really thought that I'd be a senior citizen before I could finally say I was grown up. 
I had this Uncle Arnie back in Saskatchewan. He wasn't really my uncle. He was a friend of the family, and he was a lovely, lovely man. I remember a time that he was telling this story that he thought was funny, the person he was telling it was funny, me not so much. It was about a guy who would, was in a sleeping bag, sleeping away, and a mouse visited him in his sleeping bag. And when he woke up, he was just scrambling to get out of that sleeping bag, making lots of noise. and. As Uncle Arnie was telling it, he's hooting and howling, and the other guy's hooting and howling. And there I was, sitting over there, just listening. But you know what? That story, I've never lost. I lived on a farm in Saskatchewan with my, well, four, four siblings and mom and dad. And we had a very small house, two bedrooms, and it didn't have insulation, and it didn't have didn't have much of anything really. Um, in the winter time, my dad would put plastic around the walls, and he put straw bales around the bottom, just to sort of give a little bit more insulation. And uh, so my sister and I, we had a bedroom and we had bunk beds. I slept on the bottom bunk and she slept up top. I didn't sleep well. I, I had a lot of insomnia. And in the middle of the night, when I wasn't sleeping, I was hearing mice scurrying through the walls. Of course, I remembered Uncle, Uncle Arnie's story then. And I was just so afraid that the mouse was going to join me in my bed, just like it had joined the guy in his sleeping bag. It wasn't easy to go to sleep with that mulling around in my head. So eventually, I climb up the stairs and settle in beside my little sister on, on the top bunk. That was very comforting for me. You know, Norma, my little sister, loved mice. She would bring them in from the barn, little babies without any fur on it, and want me to pet them. I wasn't interested. <laughs> I would not have anything to do with them, because I had a different attitude towards mice. So fast forward, I'm in my 40s. I live in Tawasson with my husband and my two boys. We did have a big house. And we did have insulation. At the same time that I was living there, I was working at uh, a home for autistic adolescents. We did a lot of work experience. One of the jobs was to take the students out to the owl bird refuge to feed the rats. The rats were to, for food for the owls. That was a nightmare. That was just really a test for me. Because the, the adolescents were quite skittish to begin with, and were in a little, a little trailer um, with rats, which I'm very skittish about. But that was my job. So I would go, I would get them there, I would open the door, I'd let them go in. I would hope that they were, knew what they were doing, because I didn't really want to go up close. I didn't really want to be close to the, to the rats, and I didn't really want to be close to skittish autistic adolescents, because I was the most skittish of all. So anyway, we, we got the job done, and um, then we go back to the school. Well, coincidentally, the same time that I'm working at at um, the, uh, the school, we had rats in our attic. Mm -hmm. Like, it was a nightmare. My insomnia was still with me back then. And um, I wouldn't sleep through the night. And when I wasn't sleeping, I would hear rats in my attic scurrying around. Of course, my husband, 
he didn't believe me because he didn't hear anything because he slept really well. But eventually I got him convinced that there was rats up there and we needed to do something about it. We got the pest control people in and they helped us. They found out where the hole was that the rats were coming in from and they also determined that the rats were probably enjoying the cat food that I was leaving in the garage for our cat at night. So he suggested that we just move the cat food in. You know what? I don't know exactly what else he did because I wasn't that interested. I just trusted that he knew what he was doing. And so I, um, you know, eventually, eventually the rats disappeared. He, I think he put poison up to it, but it, they, eventually they disappeared. We filled in the hole and we never heard rats again. And I also didn't stay at that school much longer either. I got myself another job. Okay, so now I'm 68 and I'm living in Ladner in a house. I live all by myself. I've got a huge backyard and I, I really, really like it there. One day I was having breakfast in my kitchen looking out at my patio, just enjoying the view and the relaxation. I saw a rat go across the patio. Oh my God. It just was just old nightmares coming back to me. Mm -hmm. However, I knew I had to do something. So when I got out of my paralysis, I walked down to the Dunbar Lumber and I asked them what they suggested. They took me over to the aisle where they had black plastic snap traps that were a little bit more user friendly than the the old-fashioned wood ones and I thought you know what that's probably better for me so I bought one I took it home I set it I put uh, peanut butter and onion that they prescribed to put in it and I went to bed the next morning I get up and I first thing I do is I look out the window the trap has gone oh, that's weird so I opened the patio door and I walked out and not too far from where I'd set it in the middle of a flower bed was the trap and inside there was a dead rat. I was, I was pretty happy. Like it's like, oh good, it's working. But then I realized, oh, oh, now, now I have to deal with it. That was a little bit tough for me. But I remembered my son Robin was with me. He, he's 35. He's a tradesman, so he's used to outside work. He wouldn't have a problem with that. So I said to him, Robin, you know, can I ask you a favor? Sure, Mom. What do you want? So I told him what, what I needed from him, and he said, oh, yeah, Mom, no problem. I'll do it later. Well, that wasn't really the answer that I was looking for. I wanted it dealt with right now. But you know, I started thinking, Robin isn't always going to be here. And there probably will be other rats. Maybe this is something that I better do. So I got a bucket. I got a couple of plastic bags, put one inside the other, inside the bucket. I went in and got gloves, my outside gloves, and I went, took it all over to the where the trap was, reached down, picked up the trap, picked it up, put it over top of the bucket, snapped it, and the rat fell out. That wasn't so hard. So then I tied it up, and then I, I tied them both up, and I just walked to the garbage and got rid of it. You know, that's a pretty good feeling for me. <laughs> I really just suddenly thought, Susan, you're a big girl now. <laughs> I really was ecstatic. It's like my sister, who died five years ago, she's not around to comfort me. 
Robin's not going to be around. You know what? When I've got stuff that needs to be done, i got to do it. Mm -hmm. And we can. A real, real sense of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! And now, for our fearless storytelling leader, uh, and wonderful leader throughout this, uh, these four sessions together, um, storytelling extraordinaire, Mary Lee Stevenson. I'll show you this. This is not the strip tease of the day, but... <laughs> Yes, type of talking, tickets available, etc. And I had always wanted to do a show, a solo show. Um, people usually play for sketch comedy, which require writing and scripts. And, and I absolutely detest writing. I've written many things, you know, the thesis, the books, and all that. But I cannot abide writing. And also for performing to me, I feel locked in. So I even took a course from T.J. Daw about how to do your own solo show. And he said, we're going to write, we're going to write. And for six weeks, a week, three hours every week at Lane Garrett College, they, people would sit there and write. I would just went into another room and napped on a couch. <laughs> but it did make it clear to me what I did not want to do. And so, so the one thing, there, the thing that I felt best about is just talking, but talking, telling a story. I was already telling stories. There's a whole world out there. I thought that the best way was to just have people say a, a word. Tell me a word, any word. Just say, say a word. Apple. Apple, okay. I grew up in Florida, and that was the land of oranges. We never thought about it one way or the other, but there, it was. We, everybody had, even if you lived in sort of rather modest situation, you had your, you had your, you know, uh, uh, orange tree in the back or your grapefruit tree in the back, and uh, and that was what was around everywhere you know but it was Orlando was again the center of the huge huge orange orange industry you know if you ever read this book called the warmth of other suns it's a recent one and it's about the crops in central Florida and about it, the, the, the crop followers the workers tended to be very much they to be black and then it's about them migrating to Detroit and to places like that during and after the war but it was a huge industry and uh, in fact, my uncle had what's called a packing house. And I was just listening to the CBC this morning. They talked about the packing house because in Kelowna, right, and in Kamloops. Because, but I, that was just a phrase we had. We'd say, and he had a packing house, which was this building where the oranges would be going by on these bands into the places where they dyed them a little more orange, mind you. <laughs> but he had that, and the, the farmers would obviously bring it in, the oranges. <laughs> And one of the things that would happen there was uh, if you got a freeze, because Central Florida can freeze, and if the freeze comes at the wrong time, you will lose your crop. And so one of the things they had were called smudge pots. They looked like they looked like curling things, but they had very very low quality kerosene in them and some sort of cloth out of them. And so when they turned them on, they just smoky, smoky, smoky. And so they would have put those. You know, they call them like they call my daddy, your cousins, everybody put out these smudge pots to save the crop. So there were those kinds of things. And we also, it, 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 it was a land of behind us was a live oak tree. There were the pine trees and everything like that. And we had apples. They were just the red delicious that came in at a certain time. But our in a sense, we were discriminated against in our in our schoolwork and in our education. You don't think of it that way, but where did those where did those books get written? Where did they get published? Who was doing them? Not people in Florida. People up north. And there would be with a grapefruit tree in the back, 
in my uncle's packing house and would be reading Dick and Jane or whoever. And so autumn would come, Thanksgiving would come, and they would go into these apple orchards and they would eat these apples and they would make these apple pies. It was just a whole other world. And it wasn't until like I was a teenager and we moved to Niagara Falls, New York, and we went over into Ontario. And there they were, you know, the trees, the apple trees. My father got into trouble by trying to tell one of the apple growers how to grow his apples. And using as the example what they did with Florida. So that was an awkward social moment. But in any case, it made me always think about how people forget in all our education other systems, they forget where it all came from and how am I going to relate to to those apples, much less if I may say. They always showed the kids walking through the autumn leaves. You're not doing that in Florida in the sand and in the piney woods or anything. No, no, you're not. It's just a whole foreign thing. But still, I'm... <laughs> The apples then, they were, and they remain, and all these many kinds, they remain for me an exotic fruit. <laughs> so I have learned. Thank you. So Susan She will be coming forward now. Woohoo! Hello, everyone. Today, I was hiding my story. The title is my first interview. Oh, wow, okay. You know, uh, in, 20, in September 2016, I became the permanent resident. Right. Right. In that month, uh, I think a problem, I want to integrate to the society mm -hmm. as soon as possible. So I decided to take a job. I think it's the best way. So I sent my resume to some stores nearby my place. And some days later, I received free interview information. Now I'll share you the first interview at McDonald's. Yeah, the dialogue between the store man manager Robin and me. Um, after a brief introduction, the manager asked me the first question. Why are you uh, apply for this job? I answered, of course, making money is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need the money to support my life, daily life and reduce my daughter's pressure. Any more reasons, he asked me. Of course, not only for making money, I have some reason as following. The first reason, because your shop, the, your, your store is very close to my place. <laughs> it's only five minutes walk. Second reason, in your store speaking English, I think it's a very environment to prove my English. The third reason, I like restaurant, uh, fast food restaurant. Uh, I think it's the platform to practice um, quick response, quick reaction, such as my hand, mm -hmm. my eyes, and my, uh, my brain. Mm, the third reason, I like teamwork. I think in this way, I can build relationship with others, get communication skills with others, and I can learn from others, and I can learn some different culture from the co-workers. I, I think it's the best way to integrate in, uh, into the society. Mm. Uh, that, that's my reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then 
Robin knocked his hand and with mouth. He said, can you show me, tell me something about your ability or your skills to take this job? I think it over and answered him. At the moment, I have no this, uh, uh, no any skills and experience to take the job. Mm, I can show you uh, something. First, I don't have the local experience at the moment. You know, it, it's not ability to a new um, permanent. permanent. Second, second reason. Now I'm 69 years old. It's over the age of retirement. The third, the third, um, my English is very poor. I don't think my English is enough good to take the job. Um, but I can show you my attitude. If I take the work, I will work hard and do my best. And I believe I can do the teamwork well because I'm very easygoing. Um, after I said, Robin told me, Susan, I decided to hire you now. <laughs> oh, it's too surprised to me. <laughs> um, he said, because I really appreciate your personality. You are so pure and uh, mm, honest. Mm, I said, I just told you the truth. She said, you know, honesty is very important character to a person. You got it. You know, everyone come here to interview, always show their advantage, their strong ability, their skills. Only you show you this ad advantage and your weak points for me. I like you very much, he said. Um, at that moment, uh, I, I I first time realized the personality it is so important, even more important than skills, than experience, and than abilities. Mm. I, I thanks to Robin. It's he, it was he discovered my good, my something good in my nature, mm. Mm, which is I have never been noticed about that, mm. yeah. Mm, and uh, Robin said, mm, I believe you can take the job. And uh, I believe you can do it very well because you have very positive attitude to the life. Yeah, mm, so <laughs> mm, I'm s presently mm, surprised at that moment. Yeah, I think Robin is the important person to my life. And it's, uh, he gave me the first chance uh, to take the job and started my career in Canada. Mm. Mm. The next day, Robin gave me the fir first uh, mm, training yeah, mm. uh, at the end, he, he said, Susan, you got very job today. It's your first day, and it's my last day. I asked, asked him, why your last day? He said, uh, he, job, he got a new job. Yeah, the last day he work, worked in the store. And uh, that time, I know, I'm the last one he had in employee in the store. Later, Robin left. I lived up to his expectation. Three months later, 
I got the honor of outstanding employee in the store. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter hear the good news. My daughter said, Oh, mom, you, you are so amazing. When I graduated from UBC, I don't have enough confidence to take the job where I speak English. Uh, you, you got it. Uh, and at your age, your age is about three times of the average in the store. You got the honor. I am really proud of you. This is my story. Why I tell my story? Because uh, I think the first, first interview is very important for me and gave very deeply impression. And the person, the manager, Robin, gave me, um, it, she, he is very nice people and so kind to me. I will always remember him. You know that the, the new manager, Jessica, two, days, uh, two years later told me he met um, Robin once. Robin still asked me my condition, asked her about my condition. Mm -hmm. So I know not only I remember Robin, he is always remember me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us tonight.